Okay, so it is now four o'clock and uh, bit by bit we'll begin. I think a few people are still turning up and settling in. So I can see a few people have cups of tea, which is wonderful. <laughs> You're welcome to drink it during the so Just relax and be at ease. And just to recap a little bit while we're waiting for everyone to settle in, yesterday we began with the noble truth of suffering, the four noble truths and the noble truth of suffering. And yesterday I uh, looked through it a little bit more with Ajahn Brahm and it's quite a huge um, chapter actually, even on the first noble truth. So I am hoping to get on to the cause of suffering and to the way leading to the end of suffering. And of course the end of suffering itself, but I don't know, we might get stuck with suffering <laughs> if we don't go a little bit um, more speedily through this. But as usual, you are invited to ask questions and um, from time to time I may, uh, just ask Derek if any questions have come in. So if anything comes up for you during this reading, please don't be shy to express any doubt or anything that needs further clarification. And particularly, I think it's really nice if we can apply these teachings to things that are happening for us in our lives. So the more real and relevant it is, then the more alive the suttas become. So please make it personal to you. Um, we don't read out your names. And again, if you want that to be confidential, you can just let Derek know and he'll uh, remove your name. So even I don't know who's asked the question. <laughs> OK, um, so don't be shy because the Buddha always asked, you know, that we should use our own wisdom and discernment and um, not to take what he says, even what he says on faith. But only if we find that it's helpful and beneficial, then we accept it for ourselves. And until then, it's a kind of hypothesis. It's a working progress you know we're sort of taking it on faith and giving it a chance seeing if it does apply to our lives and how we can experiment with these teachings in ways that bring peace but if we find it doesn't work then maybe it's something in our understanding that's amiss or maybe you know it's just not the way or the way that's described that's helpful for you at this time so you can always leave things aside yeah if it doesn't resonate or if it causes doubt or disturbance you can leave it aside and someday, at some time, it might become pertinent to you. So yesterday, we just finished talking about how these five khandas, the body, that's rupa khanda, the vedana, which Ajahn Brahm translate, translates as experience. You could also translate it as um, the effective tone of experience, because it does particularly point to that aspect of experience, which is pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant, which is sometimes referred to as neutral. And then perception, sanya, and will and other mental formations. In other words, will and those things that have come about through will. That's the sankara and also vinyana. And here we were talking about how all of those, the Buddha said, any kind of body, experience, perception, will, or consciousness whatsoever, whether past, future, or present, one's own or others, gross or subtle, inferior or superior, far or near. These are just basically the five khandas, the five components of existence. And they should all be seen as they really are with correct wisdom. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not a permanent essence. I think in the suttas, in particular, this is the Anatta Lakana Sutta, Samyutta Nikaya 22.59, a really, really important sutta, which actually caused the first five enlightened beings or after the Buddha to arise in the world. Um, I think in there, it actually says, this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. But as Ajahn said yesterday, a permanent essence is um, somehow synonymous with a self. Usually when we talk about a self, we assume something permanent, lasting and essential within inside of us. And the Buddha is trying to point out that everything is just a process. So first of all, the Buddha is pointing out this non-self aspect of the khandas. 
And today we're going to go into each one in a little bit more detail and we'll see how far we can get because it's quite straightforward. So I'll try not to elaborate too much just so that you can hear the Buddha's words and you have time to ask questions. Does that sound okay? Already? <laughs> was it okay yesterday? Like, was it challenging for people? You can nod or shake your heads. No, yes, some yeses, some noes, and some not quite sure. Okay, that's great. That shows that it's kind of doing what it should, I think. Because if it was all the same response, I kind of wouldn't believe you. But <laughs> since we're getting different responses, that shows something's working there. And um, I remember the first time, actually, I was on retreat with Ajahn Brahm. I'd heard all the teachings. I'd heard the deep stuff from my teachers in Burma. You know, these were also people I had trust in as enlightened beings. And I thought I was really aware that, you know, everything ceases and that that was a good thing. And yet when I went on his first retreat and he looked me in the eye personally and told me this, you know, and I could tell he was speaking from experience, it sent tremors right through me. And for two or three days, I was full of anxiety. It was very interesting. <laughs> so sometimes we think we've understood or we think we've know, we know it or we've accepted it. And yet actually something inside us still resists it. You know, and that is the sense of self. That's where we can see that, you know, the sense of self is still there. And you need to be able to see that, right? Unless you're enlightened, it's, already, it's still a delusion that we hold. And delusion always causes suffering. So it's very good if it causes a little bit of fear, but uh, also be gentle with yourself and you know, leave things aside if it does feel too much for now. So we'll start with, it's on page nine. Hopefully you've all got this uh, sutta reference, but you don't have to read it. I just need it help for you. So this is from the Majjhima Nikaya number 28. The form or body component of existence, that's Rupa Kanda. And what is the form component of existence? It is the four great elements and the physical qualities derived from the four great elements. And what are the four great elements? They're the earth, water, fire and the air element. So this is basically just saying that our bodies are made of stuff. They're made of physical matter. And that our bodies are no different from the earth, water, fire and air element that we see outside of us. You know, just as outside there are things that are hard, there are things that are soft. You know, there's temperature, there's weight, there's texture. So inside the body also these things exist and there's nothing different between our bodies and the matter we see outside. So this is another way to start understanding that the body is not self. There's nothing personal about it. It's actually extremely impersonal. It's part of nature. You could say nature is the owner of this body, not some kind of sense of self. And here it's talking all about the physical qualities derived from the four great elements. I um, spoke to Ajahn Brahma about this last night and he said he's glad that I'm teaching it because he's more interested in the three quarks being a theoretical physicist, which really means very little to me. <laughs> but I think the main thing that he's pointing to is that even these great elements, you know, earth, water, fire and air, even though we can actually experience them as sensations in the body, eventually the more that we meditate, we just interpret and experience it as energy as forces kind of balancing together so although for me i have practiced some four element meditation and i find that it can really sharpen the mindfulness eventually it's just a way of kind of clarifying and becoming really clear about what these bodies are composed of but the ultimate nature of that if you like ultimate nature is a bit of a abhidhamma term but the nature that you can observe is one of impermanence. Yeah. There's nothing really there. It's actually a senseless. It's not something solid and sustaining. So the physical qualities derived from the four great elements, the way it's taught in the Visuddhi Magga and the way that I've learned it from some of my Burmese teachers, are that earth can be experienced. It can be physically felt as heaviness or lightness, as hardness or softness, 
and as roughness or smoothness. So when you're doing your body scan, you might notice some of these types of sensations. And it's enough just to know, you know, this is softness, this is heaviness. You don't have to give it a name, but you can maybe discern those kind of qualities. And then you know this is the earth element manifesting in my body. Or this is the earth element, which is a component of body, would be better stated. And then the water element is fluidity and cohesion. So it's that which holds things together and that which flows. So you can feel water in your mouth, for example, the blood would be the water element. And then the fire element, it's actually more like temperature because it's the whole range of hot to cold. So we can always tell that the body has a temperature, right? It's not just neutral. It has parts of the body that are warmer, parts of the body that are cooler. So that's the um, fire element. And then the air element, which is the kind of pushing and pulling. You could also say movement. So you can feel with the breath that the abdomen might expand and then contract. And it can only expand a certain distance before it stops and then it has to contract again. So again, it's contained, it's contained by cohesion, by the water element, but it moves within the body. And these are basically all combining together all the time. Yeah? We can't exist without one of these elements, all four have to be present. And I find this a really interesting practice because even when we just meditate, say taking one of these elements such as hardness, and we just meditate, scanning the body for hardness and the sensation of hardness. I remember on one retreat afterwards, looking at a table and almost feeling much more connected with that table, understanding almost how it might feel, you know, that hard quality and realizing that that's absolutely no different from the bones in my body, you know, or from my teeth. So this can help to start understanding the body as non-self and break through that illusion of attachment to the body based on the sense of self. So the next one is from the Samyutta Nikaya, page six, number one. The experience or Vedana component of existence. There are these three types of experience, Vedana. What three? Pleasant experience through any of the six senses. Yeah? That's the eye, ear, nose, tongue, uh, um, body and the mind and we can have pleasant experience in any of those senses unpleasant experience through any of the six senses and neither unpleasant nor pleasant in other words neutral experience through any of the six senses these are the three types of experience or vedana so this is really interesting because it's a huge part of the practice and it's an important link as well in the chain of dependent origination. Vedana always leads to craving, if, especially when we're not aware of those experiences that are happening in, within ourselves. And yet there are two kinds of Vedana. There's many, many different ways that the Buddha classifies this, but you can also divide all of these into two further categories, which are Amisa and Niramisa, which means basically um, the kind of wholesome happiness, which is helpful on the path. Qualities related to things like peace or inspiration. Um, the happiness of the mind, joy, piti, tranquility, rapture. These are all wholesome happinesses that the Buddha said are not to be feared. And then there's also the amisa, um, vedana, which means kind of impure. And basically, that means anything uh, related to sensuality. And again, this isn't really a moral judgment. You know, the Buddha isn't kind of coming down like, oh, you must not enjoy your food, etc. We all enjoy our food very much here. As Ajahn Brown says, we're having some delicious food, and that really helps to nourish the body and uplift the mind. But it just means that it isn't a, a source of lasting happiness. You know, if you pursue that pleasure through the senses, it isn't really going to get you liberated. It's simply too um, unreliable, yeah? too impermanent, and it always comes to an end. Furthermore, it can make us quite attached, even addicted right, to those pleasures through the senses. And of course, it causes suffering when they disappear. Whereas the Niramisa um, experiences, especially the happiness, which is pure, 
leads to more peace, leads to more joy, and you cannot get too much of it. So there's another sutta that I want to bring in here just briefly, which is um, Majjhima Nikaya number 139, the Yavana Vibhanga Sutta, just to make this point that there the Buddha talks about two types of happiness, the ones to be pursued and the ones not to be pursued. And the ones not to be pursued are those happinesses that are based on actually um, fatiguing the body. So that's quite interesting that that can be actually pleasurable for some people. You know, maybe if you're a workaholic and you're like, you know, find it really difficult to stop your work on the computer, even though your eyes are tired and you've got a headache. And, but there's a kind of pleasure in that, you know, for the sense of self, like you're getting things done. Um, and then the other happiness not to be pursued is the happiness of sensuality again, sense pleasures, which he called coarse and low, even vulgar and common, common of the ordinary people. You know, it doesn't really lead to anything exalted or lofty or noble. And then there are the other kinds of happiness that should be pursued, that should be developed, that should not be feared. And those kinds of happiness are related to the deep meditations. So this is a really wonderful example of Niramisa happiness, pure happiness, which should be followed, which should be pursued. And those four kinds of happiness, which hopefully we'll get to further in, this, uh, in these sutta classes and also in the talks, are called Nekamasukha. And Nekamasukha is like the happiness of renunciation, the happiness of letting go, yeah, the happiness of putting down burdens. Even a little bit, even when you find you're meditating and maybe the mind's tensing up around a sensation or around a thought, and you just manage to relax with that, soften the mind towards it, soften your relationship. That's a kind of letting go, a kind of relinquishment, yeah? a non-ownership as well. I like to think of Nikama as not owning or possessing our experience. So all of the jhanas are based on that letting go. And then Paviveka Sukha means literally being um, secluded from the senses yeah? and secluded from the five hindrances as well. And then Upasama Sukha, which means the happiness of peace. And Ajahn Brown was saying today, you know, there's a certain happiness to peace. At first, it might not be very obvious because it's so much subtler than the kind of um, stimulating happiness we get through the senses. But nevertheless, there's a happiness there. Yeah? And again, they're all related to that letting go and to that seclusion from what's unwholesome. And then the last um, definition he talked about related to the happiness of jhanas is Sambodhi Sukha, which literally means the bliss of enlightenment, which is unusual for the Buddha to say because, you know, this is uh, not enlightenment yet, and yet it's something so close because it's pure you know it's similar to the mind of a buddha or an enlightened person your mind at that time is similar because it's free from the five hindrances and free from the five senses so these kind of happinesses are good to be pursued so <clears throat> i'll go through the oh, it's a strange form experience perception will i'll go through the others and then we'll have some questions okay so the perception component of existence, and this is from the Samyutta 22, number 56. And what is perception? There are these six kinds of perception. Perception of sight, sound, smells, tastes, touches, and perception of mental objects. So this again is the same as the six senses. And um, basically it's saying that whatever comes into contact with um, the mind is perceived, right? We have to perceive it. If we don't perceive it, it doesn't exist for us. So there's a lot we could say about perception, and um, this is a very interesting um, aspect of existence because we can use our perception in ways that is more wholesome, you know, or, or less wholesome, of course. So we can play around with our perception and influence, influence it in a positive direction. Yeah, so in some suttas, the Buddha actually says that the path of practice is a training in perception. So we're training our minds in ways that actually lead to the wholesome states increasing. 
Because at this stage in the practice, as long as the hindrances are there, we're not seeing things as they really are. There's always an element of fabrication or distortion of the truth. But we can start to bend our perception in ways that leads to the lessening of those hindrances. So, for example, looking at the beautiful aspect of a person rather than their faults. Yeah? It's not that the faults aren't there, but we don't have to focus on those things. If we focus on them, they tend to stand out to us more and more. And that person feels rather diminished in front of us and actually might start to enact those negative qualities because that's what you expect them to do. right? But if we focus on the beautiful part of the person, yeah, for example, in a room like this, it's so easy to focus on the beauty in everybody, in your sincerity, in coming to practice, in you know, showing up and listening to the Dhamma with eager ears. It's really easy to focus on that aspect of everybody here and of yourself, right? Sometimes it's hard to focus on the good in ourselves. You can see it in everyone else. And by doing that, we encourage it to grow. So in this way, we can actually... Uh, mold perception in ways that leads to more happiness and peace. And then the will, what is the will and the result of willing component of existence? So the Buddha says, what are volitions? That's the word that Ajahn Brahm I think has probably removed from this translation by now, but it basically means will. There are six kinds of volition, will regarding sights, Will regarding sounds, will regarding smells, tastes, touches, and mental objects. So this is interesting because it basically means any kind of reaction or response to whatever we see, smell, taste, touch, and know. Any kind of response. Yeah. So it's not that there is no will, because obviously we're going to have a response as long as we're alive. But we're just being challenged to start recognizing that that will exists, but it's not a self. In fact, that will is entirely conditioned by everything that we've heard or learned or been influenced by. Right? You know, why are we all here today? It must be because somebody told you that Buddhism might be a, a good path for you or you read it in a book. Yeah, or you've seen that the retreat was advertised, and there'll be many, many causes that led to that in your life. You know, it had to be the right time in your life. And you had to be, you had to be available for the retreat. You know, many, many different things would have come together to make this possible. So although you think that you've made the final decision, can we really be so sure? And I think this is really important because it also shows the importance of associating with the wise. You know, as far as possible, choosing the kind of um, input that we do feed our minds with. You know, you could choose to watch some kind of horrible horror movie or, you know, just constantly feed yourself with all the bad news that's on the TV seemingly every moment. Or you could choose the company of wise friends and you would be two different people depending on that. So because the will's not conditioned, because the will, sorry, is conditioned, we have an opportunity to try to um, condition it wisely. And that's a way that we can be free. And then the consciousness component of existence. So the Buddha says, what are consciousnesses? There are these six kinds of consciousness. Sight consciousness, hearing consciousness, smell consciousness, taste consciousness, body consciousness, and mind consciousness. So once again, we're just breaking everything down. All of these definitions of the body, of experience, perception, will, and consciousness are breaking it down to smaller components to show us that there's nothing actually solid there at all. Yeah. So, any questions so far? Because that's already quite a lot. <laughs> Excuse me. So I'll go to the chat. <clears throat> oh. <clears throat> Excuse me. So someone's saying, I just want to thank you, Ajahn Brahm and Venerable Chanda and all the group. See? So you're already supporting others by being here. 
I feel grateful for sharing this space with you. My camera is broken, so you cannot see me, but I just want to let you know I'm here and smiling gently to you all. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you so much. And we're smiling back. At least you can see our faces smiling at you. So someone else is asking, can we practice the four elements meditation at some point during the retreat? Thank you. Yes, I suspected that might come up now that I've mentioned the four elements. And this is Ajahn Brahm's retreat. So I do feel kind of that I would like him to take the lead in teaching these practices. Um, so I'm not sure whether that might work or not, or whether it might confuse people or add something that's maybe not so helpful at this time. Um, I can talk with him and perhaps I can introduce just a few little bits as we do the body scan. Um, but I think, yeah, really these kind of practices are best done um, to gain real benefit, best done as kind of a retreat in and of themselves because it does take time to go through all those different characteristics and to really get a feel for that. So when I've done that, it's actually been on a longer retreat of about five weeks or so. And I practiced mostly with Metta for, for the first part of the retreat. And only in the last couple of weeks, I started practicing for elements. So my mind was already very soft and very receptive and it became quite easy to go through those qualities fairly quickly. So, um, I can't promise, <laughs> but it's something that I could definitely do sometime in my uh, online groups, certainly. <clears throat> so someone else is asking, would doing some sporty activity, for example, going for a jog, be an unwholesome activity as it makes the body tired? So that's a great question. And it's one that you have to answer for yourself. You have to learn through that mindfulness and kindness to your body how much is enough and how much is too much so again i think asking your body you know because so much we live in our head and we just think i want the body to do this therefore the body has to follow my command and honestly when i was younger i had that attitude and i didn't even know i had that attitude to the body because i was fit and healthy so so far in my life until i was about 31 32 I could just do whatever my mind wanted me to do. If, it want, if I wanted to go up to the top of the Himalayas, I could do that. My body would oblige. But then when I got a chronic illness in Myanmar through living on very, very um, basic food and food that didn't really suit my body in a climate that was also incredibly intense, um, it came to a point where I had to take some steroid medication for a gastric issue. And suddenly the whole system kept collapsing. I don't know if anybody here has ever had to be on steroids, but getting off them is the problem. And somebody put their hand up, yeah. So I had to start reducing them by like a quarter of a pill. <laughs> and at that time, the steroids kind of take over your adrenaline and all kinds of functions, all kinds of hormones in the body. So when you stop taking them, even reduce them a tiny bit, the adrenaline just crashes all of a sudden so i'd start to go on a little walk just down the road and i'd have to stop at the bottom of the guest house stairs and somehow get back up the stairs and lie down and i realized wow you know my body's no longer obeying my command now i have to develop some humility <laughs> and actually you know have my life moderated by what my body can or can't do so that was quite interesting for me. And I guess since then, I've been a lot gentler to my body. But um, I do think it's important to look after the body and that can mean exercise as well. So maybe ask your body, you know, um, how much is too much and experiment a little bit. It's certainly not um, unwholesome, but if your body takes kind of a week to recover from one jog, then it probably isn't a very good thing, you know. So don't read what you read, don't kind of go for what you hear in, uh, I don't know, the latest health magazine. Sometimes I see people with these like little um, head things and they tell you how fast to walk and how many paces you've done and how much more you've got to go. And I just think, wow, so disconnected from how the body actually feels. You know? Another thing to notice is like, are you jogging feeling happy with a smile or are you jogging with grimace? Because sometimes I see joggers and they just look so unhappy. And I think, wow, <laughs> you know, why do you do that to yourself? So, yeah, even though the question seems simple, 
it's a good opportunity all these you know daily activities are good opportunities to check your motivation and your attitude and relationship with your body very good so nothing more at present so shall we carry on are we good keep going <coughs> yeah, um, it's up to you venerable if you would like more questions there are more ah there are more questions okay how many more four or five uh okay just send them in and we'll see what we can do <coughs> Okay, so the next one's quite a deep question. <coughs> and um, if I'm not able to answer any of these satisfactorily, please ask again in the evening because Ajahn Brown has very deep experience of all of this. So someone's saying, um, is the world we experience a result of our six senses? Is there a world or a plane of existence outside our senses? So it's not that this world that we live in now is necessarily a result of our six senses. It's more that it's the world of the six senses. Okay? And the world is more a result. The world that we have created is a result of our wanting. You know, we wanted to be here. We had what they call in Buddhism, bhava tanha, the craving to exist. And it's that craving that brings about birth brings about rebirth it's the cause for all of this that we experience so specifically we would have had craving for objects of the sight sounds sorry objects of the eyes ears nose etc and that's why we were born in this world but there is a world um, or a plane of existence <clears throat> outside of um, our senses and those worlds at least outside of five of them right the, the worlds which are like the jhana realms where only the mind exists. So if you want to go to those kind of realms, then we need to have some experience of the jhanas, ideally in this life, or, you know, nimitta experiences are also places where the five senses are temporarily suppressed, or um, I don't like the word suppressed, but kind of recede, yeah? They recede from our awareness because the mind becomes so empowered. It takes over, if you like, from the other senses so yes there are other realms of existence but of course the buddha taught that even those realms no matter how blissful they are are not permanent and eventually beings fall from those realms eventually when the kamma that got you into those realms is exhausted um, then whatever kind of um, wanting or whatever kind of um, i don't like the word defilement but let's just say whatever kind of craving is still there in the mind will cause another rebirth in an associated plane of existence and also the karma that's there so if you have you know committed any very heinous kind of act then but you, you haven't reached the stage of stream entry then it's possible that you can still fall to a lower realm thank you so much my throat's a little bit hoarse excuse me hmm. <clears throat> so yeah i mean we can almost experience these realms in this life right by by experiencing how how it is when things disappear the next question is will the same as sankara please and if we can exercise wisdom in the present moment then is that not a choice that we that the will makes help i'm confused so this is obviously a very confusing area but confusing in a good way in that it's an area to explore because if we really understood it you know th then we'd be quite far on the path uh, the first part of the question, yes, in this case, will is a direct translation. It's Ajahn Brown's translation of Sankhara. And sometimes he has started translating it just as will. But in here, and also I kind of keep nagging him, <laughs> to also mention that it's the will and the result of the will. What is willed? In other words, what is formed? So, for example, um, I mean, I don't mind volitional reaction as a translation because I think of Sankara as a kind of reaction to whatever we experience. So, for example, there can be an unpleasant experience in the knee and you could be very mindful and very kind to that and just be curious and, and continue observing without any 
um, loss of equanimity or peace. Or you could experience a pain in the knee and think, ah, my knee. There could be a lot of ownership of that pain, a lot of um, identification. You know, it might start spinning the mind out into a whole history of that time that you hurt your knee and you wish you hadn't because now you can't meditate and I'll never get enlightened because of that, et cetera, et cetera. And that is more of a reaction that creates more suffering, right? So to me, that is the sankara. The sankara is something that we can actually pacify by developing more mindfulness, more equilibrium or equanimity in the mind. And then we don't react so much. And so, of course, that's the sankara, the will. But the result of that will is that if the will is very less and you remain peaceful, then that pain may start to fade. But if the sankara is very strong and it's a big heap of mental reaction, then that pain will get worse and worse. You know, you must have experienced this when there's some kind of tension in the mind or in the body and you think, oh, I don't want this, you know, or you're tired and you're feeling really stressed by that. Like yesterday, I was feeling quite worried because I couldn't sleep and I was a bit stressed by that and feeling a bit miserable. Sorry for myself. Today, I'm just as tired, but I've made peace with it. <laughs> and so I'm not spending more energy on fighting the tiredness. So, yes, we do have some influence over it. But um, you're asking, is that not a choice? If we exercise wisdom in the present, is it not a choice? I would say it's more a conditioned choice. <laughs> so it appears to be a choice, but the choice is only possible because of the input that you've received. So the whole point of the Buddha's teaching is that we're not independent entities. We don't make choices that come from ourselves. You know, we're basically a mass of all the influences and experiences and you know products of our parents our society our teachers etc and it's those things that combine to to i don't know if you like show us the choices we have or influence the way we respond yeah because sometimes we think we're making a choice but are we really seeing all the options yeah it's like you can make a choice between maybe five options that you're aware of, but there might be hundreds of options that you're not aware of. But due to your conditioning, you only see the choice of five. You know, like say, if you've got to go to uni, there might be thousands of subjects you could choose from, but you're only aware of a fraction of those subjects. Like I didn't go to uni when I was 18, I went to India, which was a much better university. And then when I was 27, after searching for a monastery for many years, uh, my mother told me there was a degree in Ayurvedic studies in England, which is Indian medicine. And that was one of my interests. So I thought, OK, while I wait for my monastery, then why don't I do something good, study something useful that could help others? So I studied that degree. But at 18, I wouldn't have had a clue that that existed. I wouldn't have had any option to choose such a subject. right? So we think we have a choice, but our choices are very limited and they're also conditioned as well. So the whole point of this is not that we don't have these things, it's just that we take them to be a self when they're not. We misappropriate our experience as belonging to a self. Isn't it a relief when you realize it's just a process? It's like, ah, oh, I'm not as responsible as I thought I was, you know, it's not my fault. <laughs> and then we can be wiser about the conditioning we allow in so i find that i might have very peaceful or energized meditations during meditation but i find pleasure pleasure of them to be impermanent too yay very good so you're developing joy and wisdom so how can we see these experiences as more lasting than other pleasures from the senses I mean, feelings or pleasure during meditation, how are they more permanent? Yeah, no, I don't think we're saying that they're more permanent, but they're more nourishing and they're more reliable in the sense that it's what remains when we put all the defilements down, if that makes sense. So it's something that's less fabricated. It's something that's more real, more... Um, more a part of the mind 
it's difficult to find words for these things, but basically whenever we experience peace or feelings of metta, it's actually a state of letting go. It's because we've let go of a lot rather than that we've created those states. It's almost like metta is there when aversion ceases, when hatred ceases, that metta is there. And I think it feels more real. You know, it feels more like the default state but of course it's conditioned as well. And the Buddha did say that, you know, it's not the end of the thing. Like they're still created states. They're just less created than the suffering that we experience. So I think it's a matter of getting a taste for these things and starting to trust in that happiness, but also being careful not to cling, right? Because sometimes when these things arise, we rather want them to last rather than noticing what we did or what we didn't do for them to arise. So they're not really more permanent, but obviously they lead to something that is more permanent because when the defilements get overcome permanently, which is possible, like they get uprooted from, through seeing the cause, then a person doesn't have things like anger or lust anymore. You know, enlightenment is a real thing. So it's leading out of suffering. It's not the end of suffering yet. I don't think I answered that very well, but I want to move on so that we have some more sort of time. I wonder how to deal with the anxiety you mentioned coming up when hearing about non-self. Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. Sometimes I also find myself using this word deal with. And then I was thinking yesterday about how... Um, you know, if you think about being with a friend, you'd never say, how do I deal with a friend? You'd always say, how do I treat it? So I think, first of all, changing the language a little bit, because we usually use the word deal with when it's something we don't like. We have to deal with it. You know, we have to get rid of it because we think it's wrong. But actually, that anxiety is not a bad thing in this case. And the Buddha actually spoke about this in the text as something that's quite natural when we hear the Dhamma, because it's we only feel anxiety because something that we're clinging to is being challenged and that something is causing us suffering. So don't worry too much about the anxiety. That's the first thing. Like if we're anxious about being anxious, then that's a double dukkha. Yeah, it's like putting yeast in the bread. The bread rises and becomes twice the size. So see if you can embrace the anxiety. See if you can actually welcome it and think, oh, you know, this is interesting. This is something I haven't experienced before. Maybe, you know, there's um, something I can do to embrace this as well. Because the whole, whole idea of um, equanimity or metta, loving kindness, is being able to um, expand and embrace more and more and more of the realm of the mind and the realm of experience so that we can understand it. So when these things are coming up, they challenge us a little bit to find new ways of making peace and being gentle and soft. So, I mean, I have experienced quite a lot of anxiety recently um, during my retreat in Australia. And it was really interesting because sometimes when you're in solitude for a long time, you do go through different layers of the mind and experience things that perhaps wouldn't come up in ordinary circumstances. And the best way for me um, to learn to be with the anxiety was really softening my mind. So just knowing when that anxiety is there, trying to contact it, you know, body, I think that's really important because often the mind just spins out and wants to run away. Try and stay embodied with it and feel the sensations associated with that. And then look at the mind notice am i resisting this is there some resistance how can i be more at peace or how can i soften the mind and it's it's a subtle thing you know no one can exactly explain i find i would find it hard to explain how to soften or how to be more peaceful but we have a sense of what softness and peace is right sometimes i might actually soften my awareness by making it wider to really make sure that i can encompass everything so it's a sense like there's this almost like this hog of awareness around you and you just make it wide and then you sort of, I don't know, soften the mind. I just really relax it and even imagine the word softness or imagine your mind and your body like a sponge, you know, and all the kind of water, all the kind of, 
I don't know, tension just kind of seeping out of the sponge. Things like this can be really helpful, but the important thing is not to do it to try to get rid of the anxiety, but you're doing it to be with it in a loving way. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but also, um, if it's really causing anxiety, and it's a little bit too much practice some love and kindness because that's always really helpful as well you know just put your hand on your heart and say oh this is difficult at this moment may i be happy and well may i be with this anxiety and welcome it and relax may i just be at peace you know you can just put a few words in there because even those words can be really comforting often the the unpleasant experience of physical pain seems bound up with a response of ill will. Do you have any advice? I think we've talked about that quite a lot. So yes, it often is bound up with a response of ill will and it's sometimes hard to see which comes first. So just getting more mindful, really going into it. If you find that your mind's balanced enough and strong enough, you can really penetrate into that so-called pain. And sometimes notice that there's a lot more going on than pain. Pain is just a label, but what's actually happening could be really quite interesting. There might be heat, there might be like shooting sort of sensations, there might be tingling, there might be, I don't know, throbbing. There could be all kinds of things going on. So you can actually explore the whole area and, you know, get really interested in that. Like notice where the center of the pain is, notice how far it radiates, notice where it stops. You know, is there an edge to the pain? And if your mind is strong enough to do that, it's, uh, you can find that the equanimity develops simultaneously and it may have an effect on the pain. Um, and then, yeah, often the response of ill will is an automatic thing because obviously as human beings, we're kind of primed to avoid pain and to go for happiness. Um, so just noticing when that happens and also differentiating between you know a response that's just a automatic reaction and a response that's actually the, your body saying please with me because i might damage something here so don't stay with these things too long but see if you can explore that a little bit okay last one when doing body meditation that this body isn't mine because if it were i couldn't separate when doing the brain because if it were i couldn't separate the awareness from this body in my heart, I felt a sense of relief and peace. Is that a good way to practice body meditation by noticing in that way? Yeah, definitely. I mean, again, you know, there is no good or bad meditation, but whatever you're learning through your meditation is wonderful, right? Because you're getting your own wisdom and your wisdom will be different from someone else's wisdom. So I think it's wonderful that you're reflecting in that way. You know, anything that leads to relief and peace is definitely part of the path. One of the teachings that the Buddha gave to the first bhikkhuni, Mahapajapati Gautami, was actually also to um, Venerable Upali, who was um, a barber in his former life and became the master of discipline in the time of the Buddha. Um, he gave them a very simple teaching that basically said whatever leads to peace, to disentanglement, to solitude, to letting go, yeah, to understanding and to deep, deep peace is the path. This is the Dhamma. He said, you can know for sure this is the Dhamma. So if something leads to relief and peace, then wonderful. <laughs> And the more you are able to so-called separate the awareness or the more the awareness becomes strong, let's say, and you start to see the power of the mind, the more we realize that, you know, our awareness, our mind, our happiness that we experience in the mind doesn't depend on this body. And, you know, those experiences that many people have of nimittas, whether they experience feeling nimittas or light nimittas, that's a time when the mind becomes so strong that it almost overpowers the other five senses. And at that time, you can see that the awareness is different from the body. Yeah. And that's the kind of thing people experience in the near-death experiences as well. Apparently, there's a book. I haven't read it yet, but it's called After. Ajahn Pramali recommended it. So if anybody wants to read about near-death experiences um, and relate it to this, 
what we're talking about, nimittas and the mind, then that might be a nice thing to get hold of after the retreat. Okay, wow, we only have 10 minutes left. <laughs> and I didn't get through much of the sutta, but hopefully this is interesting to others as well. So shall we see if we can get through a little bit more? Are you up for that? Yes, okay. So the dependent origination of consciousness. So now we're going deeper into the conscious, consciousness as component of existence. And this is from Majjhima Nikaya number 28. If the sense of knowing or mind is intact, but no mind objects come into its range, then there is no manifestation of mind consciousness. If the sense of knowing is intact, mind objects come into it, its range, but there's no conscious engagement, then there's no manifestation of mind consciousness. But when the sense of knowing is intact, mind objects come into its range, and there is conscious engagement, then mind consciousness manifests. And so with the other five senses, and the origination each of their own type of consciousness. Does that make sense to people here? Yeah. So the main thing here is looking at these consciousnesses and remembering that there are six different types and understanding that they only manifest if mind objects come into the range of that consciousness or that sense of knowing. And there's conscious engagement there. So in other words, basically, there's no mind in the background waiting. It's not something that's there all the time waiting to kind of come alive. It only manifests if there are mind objects. The mind can't exist on its own. Yeah. And that's why it's possible to have an end of all this, why the mind can end. So consciousness is reckoned by the particular condition dependent upon which it arises. When consciousness arises dependent on sight and visual objects, it is reckoned as sight consciousness. When consciousness arises dependent on hearing and sounds, it's reckoned as hearing consciousness. When consciousness arises depending on smell and odors, smell consciousness, taste and flavors, taste consciousness, touch and tangibles, touch consciousness, and mind and mind objects, mind consciousness. So that's how we define those terms. Whatsoever there is a form, Rupa, this belongs to the form component of existence. Whatsoever there is of experience belongs to the experience component of existence. Whatsoever there is of perception belongs to the perception component of existence. Whatsoever there are of will and other mental formations, Sankara, this belongs to the will or sankara component of existence. And whatsoever there is of consciousnesses, all the six vinyanas, this belongs to the consciousnesses component of existence. So basically here the Buddha is saying that there's nothing outside of these five, sorry, yeah, five khandas, five khandas, isn't it? Yes. So basically there cannot be perception. He doesn't describe perception that's not included in the perception khanda. He doesn't describe any kind of consciousness that's not included in vijnana. So the term vijnana or consciousness covers all consciousness. There's nothing else outside of that. So in other words, it's a complete description of existence of you know, this existence that is human life and it's any other sentient being's life. They're all inside of these khandas. And this is really important because I think somebody pointed to this yesterday when they were asking about other teachers in the Thai forest tradition, um, talking about, you know, Buddha as being synonymous with the one who knows. You know, a Buddha has actually seen the end of the mind. He's seen that both mind and matter or the body can cease. So, of course, the mindfulness, if you want to explain the one who knows as somebody who's very mindful, that is still there. In fact, that's extremely astute and, and very, very strong. But there is no kind of knowing that survives parinibbana. There's no knowing that, you know, exists after nibbana. Otherwise, it wouldn't be nibbana. So, and then a little bit more on sankara now. 
what is the Sankara component of existence? The definition of Sankara the six, is the six types of will, or Chaitana Kaya, will involved with the objects of the six senses. So that's just to bring back the point that um, Sankara is always related to these six senses. And then dependency of consciousness. Samyutta Nikaya number 2253. Though someone might say, apart from the form, apart from experience, apart from perception, apart from will, I will make known the coming and going of consciousnesses, their passing away and rebirth, their growth, increase, and in expansion. That is impossible. Just as two sheaves of reeds might stand leaning against each other, so too with the objects of consciousness, nama rupa, as condition, consciousness comes to be. With consciousness as condition, the objects of consciousness come to be. If one were to remove those sheaves, sheaves of reeds, the other would fall. So too, with the cessation of consciousnesses, the objects of consciousness cease to exist. With the cessation of the objects of consciousness, consciousnesses cease to exist. So consciousness is dependently arisen. And this is another kind of dependent origination in brief, just looking at the consciousnesses and the objects of those consciousnesses. Yeah. So it's like they're standing against each other. These sheaves and reeds are like leaning on each other like this. So consciousness needs its objects, and without those objects, the consciousness falls down. So this is how it can happen, that when somebody goes to the jhanas and then the arupa jhana, parts of that consciousness get chopped away, yeah, so that the objects become exceedingly refined until the objects fade, and then consciousness itself stops. So this whole path, I mean, that's why we called it the art of disappearing, it's a path of fading. And what fades? Suffering fades. That's all that fades away. The Buddha taught now that he just teaches suffering and the end of suffering. That's all. And I think, you know, sometimes it can be a bit scary to hear this, but really, would you like to be left with suffering? And the beautiful thing about the path is that the more this suffering fades, it's not just replaced with kind of numbness or, you know, a sense of um, dullness. It's replaced with joy and peace. And when we start to experience that joy and peace, it gives us the confidence and the impetus to continue. You know, it becomes almost like impossible to resist. You know, that peace just pulls the mind closer and closer inward towards it. And, you know, we know that this is the right path. So wherever there's an obstacle, wherever there's resistance, you can know that that's the sense of self. And it's a good thing to meet that resistance because it's only when the practice starts to go deeper that you'll realize where you're blocked you know some practices won't challenge the sense of self they'll just keep you happy in this world and you know able to just keep functioning and producing and going to work and coming home and you know that's okay but at some point we get tired of that and we just think isn't there somewhere an end to all of this and so that end starts to come with increasing peace and it doesn't make you inactive in the world it gives you more ability to really serve so it's pretty much five o'clock and we didn't get very far, but Ajahn Brahm always says it's more important that what is taught is understood. <laughs> so hopefully it was also a little bit engaging and answered a few questions there as well. But I think we'll leave it there for now, unless there's, I mean, I don't mind five more minutes if anybody has a very um, pertinent question. Is there anything more, Derek? Uh, okay what is a feeling limiter okay so yeah I'm also a little bit unclear about this because I'm more of a feeling type of person so for me I can experience light limiter but I can also experience things that feel very similar to limiters but they're feelings so it's basically the way the mind perceives this experience and the qualities of any nimitta must be that it's very peaceful, that it's very powerful, um, that it's very, um, you could say intense, like it's something unusual that you haven't experienced before and it starts to overpower the other five senses. 
So it's something like a feeling, but it's not really a physical feeling. Maybe it's a sense of softness. Yeah, and that softness could also be, I mean, the difference between feeling and seeing is, is so subtle because softness could also be almost perceived like a ball of cotton wool and there might be a kind of hazy lightness there. Um, or a feeling limiter for me, sometimes it's like you feel that the body is kind of changing. Maybe it's um, expanding or it's maybe sinking. Sometimes I feel like the body's almost like falling through the floor. But this is also sometimes pre-light nimitter. So I'm not absolutely sure if that's a very a strong enough nimitter to get into jhana. Um, the light nimitters are a little bit more stable and easy to perceive. But it, you know, we don't have a choice about this and we don't develop these nimitters. They happen on their own. So whatever experiences like this might happen, and it's very common you know, for all kinds of different perceptions to arise in the mind, just stay with that experience, you know, enjoy it, go with it, flow with it. And most of all, see if you can keep the mind still. Because as soon as we do something, we interfere. You know, we turn back on the other senses. <laughs> and it's okay. I mean, I've done that before and gone to Ajahn Brahm and said, ah, I blew it, didn't I? And he said, well, it's par for the course, you know. <laughs> you know, you do it until one day you have enough confidence not to do it or, you know, it's a process. It's not really under our control. So don't worry too much about what kind of limiters arise um, or whether they're limiters or not. Just enjoy the process. And the more you practice and start to see the benefits in your life, the more trust you have in this process of meditation. Because we can't really measure it by experiences, honestly. I've met people who have supposedly had deep jhanas and you know they come back to the world and they don't keep basic sila there was one guy i knew and he used to be very proud and talk about getting into the jhanas and literally sort of say his name i get into first jhana such as such has achieved the jhana and in his daily life he was drinking alcohol and stealing from his girlfriend you know so to me what's the point what's the point of those experiences if they don't lead to wisdom if they don't lead to change much better that you practice um you know without naming these experiences but that it starts to transform your life and especially your virtue because that's really the heart of the change if someone is in a coma unable to process conscious objects will the sankara cease from that point onward for that person not really, no, because otherwise we could all just put ourselves in a coma and we'd be kind of enlightened, right? So unfortunately, it's not really that easy. It's just that at that moment, the we're not conscious of those objects, but the sankharas are still there, like our conditioned tendencies are still there, right? So the way we've been behaving in our life, our virtue, our tendencies are still there. Um, and when that person regains consciousness or when they perhaps pass away in this life and move to another life, the general inclination of the mind will continue along the same track. So don't worry because it's not necessarily a bad thing that they're in a coma. Um, it doesn't mean that they're going to be reborn, you know, without any kind of conscious awareness. Um, it's just the brain at that time is, um, is not working properly. But the mind is something different. And when the body passes away, the mind and the sort of momentum or inclination of that mind will determine um, the person's rebirth or determine, yeah, how, much, how many defilements, so-called, and uh, how many qualities are there. So no, unfortunately, the sankharas do not cease from that point onward. The sankharas only really cease with wisdom when delusion is destroyed. Okay, if there's no mind, what connects the rebirth and the sankharas? Okay, this is a very common question, and um, maybe it's one for Ajahn Brahm later because there's not much time now. But we're not saying there's no mind. We're not saying there's no mind. We're just saying that what we understand as mind is not a self, and it's not permanent, and it's not an entity that's kind of independent. It's dependently origin, originated. So the mind is a kind of process. And basically, uh, what connects the rebirth? 
So people think that there has to be a real thing going across to create rebirth, but it's actually mind moments that have a particular, I mean, Ajahn Brahm can explain this better, but to me, it's like they have a particular karmic energy. So if you think about your mind, say in the last meditation, and you had a moment of peace, then the next mind moment, it might seem like the same mind experiencing peace, but the next moment will be more likely to be peaceful because the last moment was peaceful. And then if you're able to you know, stay with that and kind of incline towards that peace, the next moment is likely to be perhaps even more peaceful or similar to the last mind moment. So although it seems like a continuous flow, it's actually moments arising and passing. But for that, you have to have incredibly strong mindfulness to see that process. One of the similes Ajahn Brown gives is like um, sand on the beach, grains of sand from a distance, you know, when the mind or the sight is not very strong. It looks like a continuous flow of sand, you know, unbroken because those grains are so small and they all kind of meld together. But when you go up to that sand and you look at it closely, so this is like with superpower mindfulness, your eyes are like really strong. You're looking at something at close distance. Then you see that those grains of sand are all separate. Yeah. But they're all of the same nature because it's sand. It's had a very similar um, process that formed it as sand, but it's actually separate. So it's just a process that's going on. And that process continues. I mean, these mind moments are very, very fast. So it's very hard to see. And one of the purposes of deep meditation is to actually separate that mind consciousness from the other senses so that we get um, a clearer experience of what mind actually is. And then later on, you can notice that the sight, the sound, smell, taste, touch, and mind consciousness are actually different. And they arise in close succession. They don't arise simultaneously. But this is the really deep stuff that, you know, only people with incredibly strong um, practice and lots and lots and lots of experience of, of jhana can start to see. I say that although in the Burmese tradition we do teach and my teachers also yeah and a lot of people that I know have experienced some kind of experience of the mind being impermanent even without jhana but still you need quite a deep level of samadhi you know a, a level of samadhi where the hindrances are absent for long periods of time. So that's either the samadhi just before jhana, upachara, neighborhood. So it's just before or it's just after. And Ajahn Brahma's way of teaching is to encourage um, you to get into these jhanas, first of all, and then experience those things afterwards because the, the um, samadhi after the jhana, the upachara samadhi is much stronger at that time than it is beforehand. And beforehand, you may think that it's really strong, but it, it may not be fully purified from the hindrances. So what you see may still not be as reliable as it will be later on. I hope that makes sense. That's quite a lot. And um, I better let you go for your cups of tea and your tea break. And thank you very much for being eager students of the Dhamma. <laughs> Wonderful. So we'll see you at half past six for meditation. And I promise not to giggle. I shouldn't promise. I'll try not to giggle this time. <laughs>